Hi everyone, welcome to Talk Gnosis. This is part one of four of our conversation with Dr. M. David Litva of Virginia Tech. He's going to talk to us about divinization, deification, theosis, and all of those interesting uh, concepts that have to do with becoming divine. He's going to talk to us about uh, what those words mean, how they're related to uh, various scriptures over the generations. We're going to talk a little bit about monotheism and how deification is maybe or maybe not incompatible with a monotheistic religion. We're also going to talk about Jesus and when he kind of, uh, when the ideas about his divinity started to take shape. So stick around. You're going to want to catch all of this episode. It's very interesting. We always love having Dr. Litva on, uh, and this is the second time he's been with us. So stay tuned for this episode, part one of four with Dr. M. David Litva, personal deification. Dr. Litva, deification, divinization, and theosis. How do you define these three terms and how do they differ from each other? Well, it's a good question. Uh, many people use them synonymously, and I think that's perfectly fine. Some people prefer to use theosis to designate specifically Christian forms of deification, um, but that's not universal. I personally use the term deification as the broadest possible term, um, and one that I think uh, works best for historians. And, uh, and what, would that, uh, what does that word mean? So <laughs> in its most simplest form, uh, deification means becoming a god, mm -hmm. uh, from deus, the Latin word for god, and facio, meaning to make. Um, so there already is in deification the sense of making a god. Um, that's essentially what theosis means. It's the process of, of godding or en-godding. Sometimes that's used in English, uh, but more or less becoming a god. Some people use divinization as a lesser form of deification. So becoming divine would mean something less than becoming god but that's not necessarily uh, universal. People use that as synonymous as well. Okay. Now, this is a, a topic that you've written quite a bit about, but I understand that you have a, a new book you know, on this subject. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your new book and your impetus for writing it? Sure. The new book uh, that just came out from Oxford this October uh, is called uh, Desiring Divinity. Self deification in Jewish and Christian traditions, or Jewish and Ju Jewish and Christian myth making, and I wrote this book because I always found it fascinating that both in the Hebrew Bible and in Christian texts you had figures who claimed divinity for themselves, and it's often the case that people write these figures off as uh, megalomaniacal and evil or blasphemous. Whereas that's not always the case. Uh, some of these people who claim divinity, including Jesus himself, um, are not depicted as arrogant or prideful. Uh, they are depicted as absolutely correct. Although persecuted on earth, they are justified and eventually rise to the heavens. And the question is, why is that? And why do we have this contrast of some people making divine claims who end up roasting um, in hell or in an afterlife punishment and being persecuted as blasphemers. Uh, why do we have that, this self-deifying rebel, contrasted with this self-deifying hero? And in the end, who's right? Should we deify ourselves? Is that inherently bad? Or is that just part of the human condition that we're striving for something greater than ourselves, we're striving to be something, to be greater than ourselves. Is that so bad? That's right. what the book looks at. <laughs> oh, that, that's awesome. And, and it covers a fair amount of ground, right? You start back in, in the ancient world and you go right up until the modern day, is that correct? Well, that book uh, is actually a, a previous book of mine, oh, okay. uh, yeah, called Becoming Divine. In, in Desiring divinity, I just treat ancient world. Okay. 
Um, you already touched on the Hebrew Bible. Uh, when I do the questions, uh, this is your second time on the show, uh, I write some infamously leading questions. <laughs> so this is one of them. Okay. So uh, the, these, these ideas about divinization, self-divinization, in the Judaisms that we find in the Bible and existing up until the Second Temple. I'm saying Judaisms with an S, or I don't even like the term Judaism until after the Second Temple, but you know what I mean. Um, uh, the, these, uh, the Semitic religion. Uh, how can you have divinization? Because isn't there just one God in monotheism? So the, if, if people are self-deifying, or if there's theosis, or if there's divinization, isn't that creating more gods? Are these ideas foreign to, uh, to Judaism? Did they enter through the Hellenistic Greek culture that was in the Mediterranean? Well, it's a great question, and it's important to ask because Jews even today uh, pride themselves, or have a certain pride, for introducing uh, monotheism, or at least supporting monotheism, which became our major theological tradition in the Western world, and monotheism is obviously important, but we have to be clear about what it is. And monotheism, as I understand it, means the centrality or primacy of power held by one particular deity. And in the Jewish case, that would be the deity called Yahweh. And there's no question that he has supreme power and that he is the supreme lord of the universe. But that does not at all mean that he would exclude other deities in that universe. And we see time and time again in ancient Jewish texts where various figures are called gods, including beings that are called angels or malachim. Um, the ghost of Samuel is called an Elohim, which is the Hebrew word for god or gods. And we have figures like Enoch in the book of First Enoch who takes a trip to heaven and ends up realizing that he is the son of man or the son of the human who is depicted as a prime mediator figure, God's right-hand man, so to speak, the universe. And this figure clearly is divine because by virtue of receiving worship. And so, again, time and time again, we see in Jewish texts, uh, right up in the Hebrew Bible, right up to the Dead Sea Scrolls, and into other pseudepigrapha, that there are various gods mentioned. And Yahweh does not seem to have a problem with that. And so we need to be clear that what we mean by deification in a Jewish sense indicates that there can indeed be many gods as long as we're clear that one God has all the power, the cent or the central, is still central in terms of having supreme power over these other deities. But I think that in many cases, not in all, Yahweh does welcome other gods into the divine family, sometimes called the divine council. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, but we need your help. Talk Gnosis and all of the shows on the Gnostic Wisdom Network are free and will always be free, but it does cost us a lot of time and money to actually make these shows. So what I'd like to ask is that if you have enjoyed our programming, if you've found something useful uh, about it, if you've been educated, please consider becoming a patron over on our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash Gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash Gnostic. We've got a whole bunch of new shows that we'd like to start making, but we can't do it until we can start to support ourselves a little bit more financially. And um, we really hope that you will assist us in our goals. Uh, we've got a great show coming up about sex and spirituality with uh, Reverend Mr. Jonathan Stewart from Talk Gnosis and his wife, Sarah Beale. Uh, we've got The Lost Word coming back, Esoteric Freemasonry and Fraternal Orders and initiate, initi Initiatory Orders and all that kind of thing. We've got Temples and Tentacles uh, with some weird fiction authors, kind of Lovecraftian spirituality stuff that I think you're really going to like. Plus some really interesting kind of fictional and um, 
uh, kind of entertainment based things that we want to do that also have kind of an esoteric agnostic educational component. So please, uh, we need your help to make all of this possible. We have big dreams, but we don't have a lot of resources to make those dreams a reality. So please do visit patreon.com slash Gnostic if you haven't already and uh, pledge. You just give a small amount of money uh, for every educational media thing that we put out. And then at the end of the month, your, your card gets charged. You can set an upper limit so that you're, ne you're never surprised by uh, too many things getting charged on your card per month. It's really very easy and very painless and it makes a huge difference to the Gnostic Educational Ministry of the Gnostic Wisdom Network, the Apostolic Joe and I Church, and all of us here who work so hard to bring you this, um, what we think anyway, is pretty great content. So if you agree, that's patreon.com slash Gnostic. Sorry again for the interruption and back to the show. So when does this happen that there, um, you know, the God, the, there's one primary God and then there are other kind of little gods. And when does it become kind of blasphemous to, to talk about other gods in that sense? Well, there's a famous heresy mentioned in rabbinic texts called the two powers heresy. And the rabbis who were active in the second and third century CE uh, were reacting against uh, various sects that indicated that God did have a vizier, that is a prime minister figure who was operative in the creation. And for Christians, of course, this was Jesus, but for other groups, this would have been various other figures. You can imagine Enoch or the Son of Man or etc. wisdom uh, at creation. What seems to be happening is it's the rabbinic uh, interpreters who are hammering out an exclusive monotheism, often in response to the Christian or Trinitarian version of monotheism. But I would have to say that even for the rabbis in the ancient world, they don't think of exclusive monotheism in quite the same way that, that we do. Um, I would say throughout antiquity, there was always a sense that God did share power. And by virtue of sharing power uh, and function and name, other people could be divine, even if there was a hesitancy to call these figures directly gods by the time of the, by the rabbinic period. Uh, that does lead into my next leading question. There, there's a pretty common idea, I, I think, um, in sort of the secular West, that uh, Jesus is uh, this uh, this cool guy, right? The historical Jesus, and he travels around uh, teaching, you know, peace and love, and he's crucified. And then, much, 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 much later in the tradition, uh, there's all these myths that that grow up about him being divine. Um, is is that view it? accurate in in your uh, uh in your um, in your view is is this uh is are these ideas about jesus being a divine figure much much later developments and is this again something that's being brought in from so-called hellenism or so-called greek uh, and pagan influence from around the mediterranean well again it's another great question one of those really big questions that are very difficult to answer but one thing that one I was just thing to say that, dr Lewy, every 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 question on the sheet uh, tonight is could basically be a show, a show in itself <laughs> but uh, sorry to interrupt uh, please right. go on well one thing that we need to be clear on is that hellenism never came in and what i mean by that is by the first century that is the period in which jesus is said to live that what we call Hellenism had already been dominant in that culture for 300 years, that Alexander the Great had gone in a rampage and had conquered all those areas, including what, everything we call Palestine, 300 years before Jesus was born. So there's no question about Hellenism coming in. It was already there. It was simply the culture that Jews had been in for centuries. So if we're, if we're going to talk about outside influence, that metaphor makes no sense historically because the Jews had already more or less acculturated and had formed a hybrid culture with everybody else in the Mediterranean world. So 
it just Hellenism, if that's what we want to call it, was just there. And we need to be prepared, I think, to talk about the mythologization of Jesus. But I think that those who think that the mythologiz mythologization of Jesus occurred late are, um, or exclusively occurred late, are simply mistaken. We need to take account of the fact that a lot of myths about people becoming divine uh, had already been in place for centuries. And this idea that uh, there was some kind of conspiracy in, at the Council of Nicaea to make a poor Jewish peasant into the second person of the Trinity based on, you know, Plato is, is ridiculous. Uh, the, mytholo the mythology is already in place for Jesus to become a divine figure, and it's probably true to a certain degree that Jesus himself may have thought that he was a divine figure because he applied that mythology to himself. And certainly with after the experiences, visionary experiences of a resurrected Jesus, almost the early Christians would almost be forced to, in my, my opinion, think of this figure as divine. And within 20 years, I think, of these early resurrection visions, you have, I think, a fully divine Jesus as testified in the letters of Paul. This is not... The divinization of Jesus or the deification of Jesus is not a not a late movement, or at least it's not exclusively late. It's extremely it occurs extremely rapidly, for for two reasons: because the mythology of divine humanity is already in place. They are, Jews already had Enoch and already had other the the king being thought of as the son of God, and second, it's is the result of powerful Christian experiences of Jesus as a resurrected heavenly figure. And if he's a resurrected heavenly figure, living immortal and exercising power of the cosmos, that figure is a god. So if we want to call that mythologization, that's fine, but that happened rapidly. I've been having a lot of conversations lately about the uh, ecumenical councils. Uh, I don't know what it is in the air, but um, the the idea that um, the arguing about the divinity of Jesus was kind of the entirety of early Christianity and you know, groups having differing opinions on how divine was Jesus exactly and you know uh, was he divine when he was born and you know all of this stuff and how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, the way that I've kind of been describing it and I actually don't know how accurate this is but is uh, you know is a different groups fighting with each other to promote their particular idea and you know one idea or another winning out in a kind of popularity contest and some people get punched in the face or whatever but uh, uh, it, it's um, it seems to me that the divinity of Jesus uh, being one of these points of argument, and not exactly whether Jesus was divine, but at what point he was divine, or how divine was he, and where does he fall in the hierarchy? Um, what do you think uh, kind of led to the um, Trinitarian concepts of Jesus as a um, co-eternal uh, part of the one true divinity? Um, and can you answer in 140 characters or less? <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to address something that you, you said, which I think is very accurate. The way I describe it is early Christianity is not a horse race. That is, it's often conceived that there are these early Christian groups competing and with these competing Christologies, and some people won and some people lost. And I think that's a terrible way to view things, and terribly naive and inaccurate. There are essentially are no winners and losers. That when you have traditions, they are used, reused, adapted, and recycled. And the ideas that seem to fade away are often those very ideas that are transformed into something new. And today's heresy often becomes tomorrow's orthodoxy if you can tweak it, hmm. and vice versa. So, 
nobody really wins or loses. I mean, I, I admit that some people do get burned and destroyed, but the ideas are always in the process of rapid transformation and transmogrification, and people are going to adapt whatever it takes. And I think that this is really what happens uh, as we get into the fourth century, and I'm actually not an expert in the fourth century. I'm an expert in the first and second. Mm -hmm. But what I can say about these church councils is this is a way to finally come to grips with Christianity and the heritage of ancient philosophy. And what we call the Trinity um, is simply an attempt to make early Christian views of deity philosophically acceptable. And I think that a lot of people, you know, this is, this is rationalism. Mm. Um, this is the attempt to make the faith look as rational as possible, even though at the end they say that, you know, it, it's a mystery and <laughs> that's fine. We don't really know what the Trinity is. My point, I, I think, is that these early Christians are, most early Christians, I would argue, agree that Jesus is divine in, in some sense. Um, the question is, you've got, you've got a pushback later in the fourth century to combine a fully human and fully divine figure, and that causes some philosophical and logical problems. Mm -hmm which were never at issue in the first and second century. But in order to make the faith uh, philosophically and rationally responsible to an elite, uh, to a new elite, a new Christian elite, that there was an attempt to hammer out a lot of the details. And unfortunately, as these creedal formations got more and more specific, more and more people got excluded. And... Um, just reality. The more precise you are, the less people <laughs> you can please. Um, so I, I don't have any magic answers of <laughs> how we get from A to B, but that is what I can say.